Hello and welcome to the Books Uncovered podcast, a podcast brought to you by Fulcrum Publishing, where we explore the world of books and the people who make up the publishing and the book industry. I'm Sam Shinta, publisher of Fulcrum Publishing, and I'm joined by my co-host, Kateri Kramer, Fulcrum's marketing director. Hello, Kateri. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm great. I It looks to me like you are sitting outdoors today for I a change. Am. And uh, uh, yeah. I, it's chilly, but it's sunny, uh, which is really all that mattered. And I thought getting some vitamin D would be good. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah. I see yeah. a lot of greenery in the background too, which is just yeah. quite lovely. Yeah. Everything is like still quasi alive, which is kind of nice. Um, yeah. Just bring it well, in when it gets cold. Here in Wisconsin, everything that is still struggling to stay alive is about to die over the yeah. next couple of days because uh, the the late fall is is arriving with a with a vengeance. We had one of those weird couple of days where yesterday it got up to sixty five plus degrees out and actually warmed up through the evening, and it's was still sitting above sixties this morning and it's supposed to be about thirty to thirty five by about six o'clock tonight. Oh yeah, <laughs> and then and then They're that's our. Good that's our high point for the next yep. uh, week or so. So, yep. yeah. Well, to every season, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, let's uh, go ahead and introduce, we have got a, a great, great guest here today. As, as always, it seems like we're just finding these wonderful guests. Our guest today is Bob Budd. Bob Budd is a fifth generation Wyoming native and has worked throughout the West on natural resource issues for more than 40 years. He has a Master of Science degree in Range Management and a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Business and Animal Science from the University of Wyoming. He has worked as Executive Director of the Wyoming Stock Growers Association, managed ranchers and ranches and other lands for the Nature Conservancy, and is currently the Executive Director of the Wyoming Wildlife and Natural Resource Trust, a state agency dedicated to maintaining and restoring natural landscapes and ecological function in Wyoming. He is past president of the International Society for Range Management and the Wyoming chapter of the Wildlife Society, and a past public relations chairman for Cheyenne Frontier Days. He has facilitated management plans for the Big Sandy River, Bighorn Sheep, and most recently, Sage Grouse in Wyoming in the West. Bob and his wife, Lynn, live in Cheyenne and have three grown children, Joe, Jake, and Maggie. And he is most recently the author of Otter's Dance, a collection of writings about Wyoming and the West. Welcome, Bob Budd. Thanks for having me. Glad to be well, with you. It is great to see you. Great to see you. I hope everything is going well up there in Wyoming these days. Well, we went from 65 to 20 yesterday, so uh, we're in our <laughs> Similar normal, to here. Yeah, normal mood swing of the of the universe. And, and let me take a wild guess uh, up there. It's probably windy as well. It wasn't yesterday, but it is today. Okay. <laughs> and last weekend we had a uh, a gust of 111 miles an hour, blew a four thousand oh pound trailer my. right off the off the ball. So holy uh, cow! Yeah, it's been it's been ripping. Oh, that's <laughs> that that is just I I just I there's there are few winds like Wyoming winds in this country. <laughs> Well, Bob, you have you've written a lovely new book, Otter's Dance, in which you explore your relationship to the land and how that has developed over the years. When did you first become aware of the issues of conservation and stewardship? And how did that happen for you? I, I think it's almost osmotic, to be honest with you. I mean, I grew up around people who had a deep uh, reverence for the outdoors and for nature. Um, ranching families. I mean, you live with life and death on a, on a daily basis and you, you hitch your wagon to rain and you, and you hope that you get it. I mean, it, it, that was just kind of a ingrained in, in my upbringing, but, uh, I, I think the, the polite way you, you were polite in asking the question, when did I realize I was such a weird little kid? Um, that was <laughs> probably didn't realize that for a long time. I, I just, to me, every chance to be outside was, was a, was something that I relished. And uh, my mother always used to tell the story that they just finally gave up on buying me new pants. Cause I'd have the knees worn out by noon and she just patched them and patched them. I, she had an old pair. She showed somebody once had about six different patches on the knees and, you know, <laughs> it, it, but yeah, I, I think Sam, it, it, it's just the, the way I was raised. And, and I think the word is the right word is reverence. I think that that's, what we were taught to 
to have, you know, there, you, you can't stare in the eyes of a, a mule deer doe and not be moved. And, and Absolutely. I did it from the time I was a little kid. So it's always been there. And then I, I guess where I really got into it more deeply is when I worked for the stock growers association, seeing that in thousands of families out there and getting your knees under their table and hearing their stories, it just, it just opened your heart and it brought it home to you that this is really something special and something we better keep or, or we're going to rue the day that we lost it. And when did, uh, when did Aldo Leopold come into the equation for you? That's a really interesting question because Aldo Leopold, I was required to read uh, Sound County Almanac in freshman year in college at, in an English class. And I read it and it was like, okay, um, I, I didn't, I, I wasn't hooked uh, at all. And then later uh, I was asked to probably after I graduated from college, uh, I picked up another book, The River of the Mother of God. And, and that one was a completely different experience. And it was just, okay, this is exactly the, the things that I think about. And then from there, uh, it was just different immersions in that and meeting people who were his biographers and people who uh, knew had, had known him and meeting the family. And uh, that, that just grew and grew and grew. And I, I still go back at least once a year and read one or the other of his books. It just, they're very, very, uh, you look at when they were done. I mean, they, they were 40, 50, a hundred years ahead of their time. Um, it seems like there's a unique relationship between literature and writing and conservation that is maybe not as distinct in other areas. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about what your take on that relationship is and the importance of literature and writing in the conservation space. Yeah, and I may expand it even a little bit, Kateri. It, yeah. um, it it's interesting because the things that I think are, are thought provoking and, and the feedback I've had from Otter's Dance are the things that are experiential, that you've actually experienced. You're not just writing about a mountain, you're writing about being on the mountain. You're, you're not writing about uh, deer, you're writing about being with deer. You, you, it, it, is, it is deeply, deeply personal, but it's, it's a, a relationship like you have with your family and friends. And and I think that's that's where the ones that click do that. Um, I'd go a step further and say, why is literature so important? You know, I grew up in a place called the icebox of the nation. And, and people used to joke about once winter hit, nobody ever went anywhere until the thaw came. And so I can remember as a kid watching my grandmother, my great grandmother, my parents stack books to read through the winter. And you literally would go, you know, days, weeks without leaving. And uh, TV was sketchy if there was any at all. Uh, we lived in a, in a hole and, and, and later in life in a canyon, uh, you could put up all the antennas you wanted. You couldn't reach 5,000 feet above the canyon wall. So you, you really had a, a deep connection to, to what you read and, and how that, how that uh, affected you. And, and I think you see a lot of ranchers, they're readers. I mean, they, they spend a lot of time and they immerse themselves in it. And, and it's just because of, of where we live and, and the, the things that happen around us. That makes a lot you, of sense. You, you mentioned that whole idea of the experiential uh, aspect of this. And, and, you know, I want to come at this from a couple perspectives here, because when we talk about environmental issues or conservation, we tend to leave out oftentimes, or many people will leave out uh, folks like ranchers, right? So maybe talk a little bit about ranchers and their connection with the land and why maybe stewardship is a deeper thing for them than, than many people even appreciate. Well, uh, yeah. And I appreciate the question because I think, you know, and, and actually there you can go into a lot of, a lot of depth on that question alone. And there, there have been numerous symposia uh, aimed at that but there there for whatever reason there is some notion out there that conservation means no people involved and that is just absolutely not a good choice uh 
you know, stewardship implies somebody who is paying attention. They're looking at what's happening with weather patterns. They're looking at what's happening on the ground. And that's happening daily. And that's what ranchers do. And, and you'll see that in the book, as you well know, Sam. It, uh, it, it's, it's an ongoing relationship. And so you, you develop an understanding for the place you live in. You develop an understanding of where the deer go to hide. You know where the, when you see the river otters on the creek, you know what they're there, why they're there and, and what you need to do to keep them there. When you don't have beaver, you know why, you, you know, you don't and you know what you need to do to, to get them back. And, and people have, you, you can't go at it with any kind of a linear way of thinking. Uh, you can't think just economics. You can't think just uh, culture and you can't think just ecology. It's all of those and how they're blended. And I, I think that you're right that a lot of people don't realize the people on the land. It's a there's a quote that Kateri pulled out for the sticker that that really captures it. You know, ultimately the fate of landscapes lies in the hands of people on the land, and that is the truth. If 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 the person out there who doesn't doesn't care, then you'll have one result. If they care deeply, you'll have a different result. And I, I had a friend uh, call me the other day and they had reread Where Will the Moose Live? And she said, I'm, I'm so worried about what will happen to our valley. Uh, we have one, one landowner who may sell. And if they do, it could upset everything. And, and we're seeing that happen in the West. We're seeing choices be made that maybe aren't the best long-term choices. Uh, you know, and, and, and we tend to do that as, as Americans, perhaps as humans, go headlong in one direction and then catch ourselves 10 years down the road and say, oh, wow, maybe we shouldn't have done that. Well, it may be too late. You know, and on, on a similar uh, uh, path here, uh, you're also an avid outdoorsman. You've, you've been a guide, uh, you're a fisherman, you're a hunter. And again, I think this is another group of folks that often we forget uh, our, our stewards and, and, and our key conservationists. Again, what, what, what are many in the public perhaps missing about that connection between conservation stewardship and those, those people who use the land outdoors in that way? I think the thing they're missing, there are a couple. One is those people are the ones who are mainly paying for wildlife conservation in the country because it's hunting license fees and those things that, that, that that's what game and fish departments run on. Um, but I don't think at times sportsmen take enough credit for, again, uh, the very deep spiritual personal relationship that they have. And, and that's been something I, as I kind of reread Otter's Dance occasionally, I'll, I'll sit there and think, oh man, I just, that's kind of really getting into the core of me. And it's a little scary to be out there that way. And, and I think that that's something that a lot of sportsmen, haven't had experience with perhaps uh you know you talk about it over a campfire you talk about it when you're driving down the road and you're both looking out the front windshield um i talk about it with those people but you know there's a there's a again a deep reverence for the outdoors and the ecosystems that we live in and the ones that the the critters we admire live in um the thing i think a lot of people don't understand and and i hope the book conveys this is that a lot of times when you're hunting, it, it, the work starts if you get something. The mm -hmm. fun is in being out there. You know, it's, it's sitting there and watching moose, two cow moose fight while you're basically supposed to be hunting elk. And you forgot about that part because this was too, it was too incredible to watch, you know, and, and, and you get caught up in it. Um, the cold wind in your face, the warm sun on your back. Those are the things that, that build on us and, and, and that we we, you know, that's what, what, why you do it is to be out. It isn't necessarily to, uh, the thrill of the, of the kill or something uh, that is, I mean, that is part of it. And then the food part of it is important, but yeah, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about being out there and, and, and being in a system that you do not control. I'm that I was just actually, uh, having an exchange this morning with my, my dear friend, uh, who was out in Montana hunting uh, mule deer this week. And he shot he shot a buck for the first time. So he's gone out a few years, but he shot his his buck out in the Rockies out there. And uh, his his text said, "Grizzly stalked us the way out, one mile retrieval after dark." 
It was a hard mental game, ethically obligated to get it out, but physically exhausting. <laughs> and you know, this is somebody that uh, that has that same reverence for the land. But as you say, the hard work starts when <laughs> you get out there a ways, and all of a sudden, you know, you're in this open landscape, this beautiful open range, and realizing, oh goodness, <laughs> not only am I among all these wonderful creatures and all among all this beautiful land here but I'm going to have to deal with whatever I do out here and, and make it back in one piece. Yeah. There's a certain, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but there is a certain heightening of your senses when you realize that you may be the predator and the prey at the same time. Um, and that, that exists still out here. Uh, yeah. It, it, I think being out there is that's the, that's the key. The other part that shouldn't go without mention is that hunting is actually a, a, way that we manage populations. And so if you look at overpopulation of, of whatever it is, whether it's white-tailed deer where you are, Sam, or whether it's elk mm -hmm. where I am, the, the mechanism we have to control that in, to some degree is hunting. And, and it's an important mechanism. Uh, so, you know, it, it, we don't raise them. They're not inside fences. They're not, these are not livestock. They're wild animals and, and they can overpopulate. And and so using that tool and, and at the same time providing some reverence and some understanding of the mm -hmm. needs of conservation is, is very valuable. As you're talking about this, it's, it feels a little bit like there's like three silos of people who are kind of involved in conservation and they're very separate. There's like the ranchers and the private landowners, then there's the sportsmen, and then there's like the politicians, like maybe like textbook advocates, you could say, the people who are like on social media and calling like representatives, that kind of thing. Do you think those people need to start working together? Because I think, I don't know, at least from, from a person who's only semi-involved in it, it sort of feels like there's there's three camps that you can fit in, but you can't really kind of go between them. Well, there, yeah, I, there may be more than three camps, Kateri. Yeah. It's uh, it, but where where I come down or where I think this is is that there are there's a radical element on on one end that would tell you, uh, and I mean, this is two days after the general election, right? You got a radical element on one end that would say, don't touch anything. It's all, you know, keep people out other than me. You got a radical element on the other side that says, you know, go balls the wall to develop and don't worry about any consequences. And then you've got this vast majority that are what I call the radical center. And those are people who are looking at balanced conservation hmm. with, with our other needs. And, and that includes not just ranchers and, and hunters and, and fishermen, but energy companies and other, and you know, cities, towns, counties, uh, municipalities that are starting to say, we we can't have everything if we don't manage to keep them. And uh, you know, just had a conversation yesterday with a, a county in uh, in Colorado, and they're they're looking at that balance, and we're asking, how do you do it? Well, the way you do it is everybody has a seat at the table. And the only way you lose your seat at the table is to join one of the extreme ends and not be willing to talk about solutions. And we've been very fortunate in Wyoming that we've got that. We've done things that uh, when we started sage grouse, I, the governor looked at me and he said, you're nuts. But if it works, I'm going to take full credit. And and he is. Um, you met him, <laughs> you know, uh, great guy. But it was like, really, you're going to have oil and gas companies and environmental groups and ranchers, county commissioners, and all these people sit at the table and come up with a solution. And the answer is yes, and it does work. But if you, if you just decide to sit at the door and growl about everything, you're not contributing to a solution. And, and yeah, so there, you're, you're right. There's probably three camps. There's the, and, and the two on the extreme tend to use the courts as their bludgeoning mm -hmm. weapon. The others tend to use science and, and common sense as theirs. What do you feel like uh, is maybe the most urgent or pressing conservation need in the American West right now? I think there's a couple of them. Uh, one is that, and, and I just made this comment to somebody this morning, that we are not going to, to stand by 
and be a sacrifice area to provide energy or whatever else the populated centers east and west of us want. That is not what we're going to do. This is the American Serengeti, for God's sakes. We've got wildlife that have been here for millennia, you know, and 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 they're wild and they they still live in their natural environments. And we are not going to sacrifice that. We can't. Um, and so the two pressures that are that are really most preeminent in the West right now that we have any control over are people who are trying to escape the rat race and they're coming here and they wanna have their little piece of paradise. And pretty soon that whole chunk of paradise is no longer paradise. The other is the, the headlong rush to develop renewable energy, which is a great place in, in, in our country's evolution. But it, it isn't just because it looks like it isn't great uh, lush habitat, you know, the sagebrush steppe or the grasslands, those are incredibly rich bio, with biodiversity. They're incredibly rich with native species, and they're not something that we can just sacrifice. And then, you know, you can throw other things on top of that. We've had extended drought. You look at climate change, you look at those things, they're very real. But we don't exactly have any control over that. The things we can control are us. And, and, and that's probably the biggest threat we have right now in the certainly in the, in the Rocky Mountain region. You know, it's, it's amazing to me how much all this keeps coming back to this idea of stewardship. And uh, I've got this uh, friend, another outdoorsman out here, a guy by the name of Rick Kite, who's an ethicist, but also avid hunter and fisher. And uh, we'll, we'll get you together with Rick at some point, because you'll, you'll really enjoy each other. Uh, but Rick and I did a podcast uh, while during the pandemic because we needed something to keep us uh, out of trouble, I suppose. And one of the things that we were doing was we were talking about folks about restoring civic virtue. And uh, both of us made the observation that if you kind of look at the classical virtue, virtues, we always felt that stewardship needed to be added to that. And especially if you look in our kind of American context, if you read the preamble, and I just gave a talk about this last week, uh, there's that wonderful turn of phrase, right? All those gifts that are bestowed upon us for ourselves and our posterity. And this notion that stewardship is baked right in the cake. And yet, so many people these days, at least when it comes to political issues, seem to be short-term consequentialists, right? They're looking for that immediate win or that immediate result, as opposed to thinking not only about their neighbors and what their neighbors might be looking for. So that's your whole idea of coming to the table with everybody, but also what's going to happen three, four, five, ten generations down the pike and ensuring that we're preserving all this for them. And so what you're talking about, I think, is just the, the vision that we just have to embrace. Well, it is. And I think that it, you know, as I said, that was baked in that when I was a kid, it was baked in. But if you look you know, and, and it's sad that the, the the change perhaps in the way that that things are done, and, and you alluded to it, there there's a gotcha mentality, you know. So if I, I remember a guy came, we had completely restored a riparian area, taken it from basically just nothing but dirt to back to where it was lush. We had fish, we had frogs, we had river otters, we had beaver, all of those things. And 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 a guy shows up at a, a tour. And he stood there and he pointed and he just pointed to the ground. And he said, that's a dandelion. Yeah, OK, so it's a dandelion. What do you think we we're going to make it perfect overnight? Besides that, sage grouse love dandelions. They eat them. <laughs> um, and so do deer and other things. But the point was, it was just this hard uh, gotcha moment that, that he was sensing, whereas everybody else was feeling what was around them and saying, OK, so that we can take care of this, we can do these things right, we can clean our water up, we can have those things. And I think that's really hard on people in ranching because on any given day, somebody's trying to do a gotcha moment. Well, if it's at the fifth year of a five-year drought, there's gotcha moments everywhere. I love what one of my friends and mentors said one time. He said, I, I finally, and I, I built this into my management strategy the rest of my career. He said, I just have come to the grips with the fact that, you know what, every year I'm going to screw something up and it'll be bad. I just don't want to do it the same place two years in a row. And I thought, wow, you know, so we gave our employees, I said, you all are entitled 
to one major screw up. Okay. We're just telling you beginning of the year, I don't care when it is. All you have to do is go, I'm counting this as my one major screw up. No questions asked. We're done. We walk away. And it was amazing how much liberation that provided because then all of a sudden they're out there trying things. And I remember Harry Day, God rest his soul, came in one day and he said, you need to come look at what I did. And he had he had just taken a bunch of cows and pulverized an area full of leafy spurge, which is a nasty weed. And it looked like a, a corral. And I said, oh God, Harry, I don't know. And he said, well, if it doesn't work, it's my one screw up. <laughs> and it worked magnificently. We used photo before and after photos of that for years to show people the power of using animals and the power of, of thinking outside the box. And, and, you know, and then of course, every year, nobody would claim their one screw up. And it, we had a, quite a fun event toward the end of the year around New Year's where everybody had to reveal what theirs was in case others didn't know. And uh, it got to be a, a joyous thing to admit, yeah, I messed this up. But the point is, it was liberating. People, there was no fear of failure that overrode everything you did. There was a sense of wonder. And that's a completely different uh, way to operate. You know, one of the other things I think about when I think about your idea of bringing everybody to the table is one of those seats has to be the government. And out, out West in particular, obviously the government's the, the biggest landowner of the American West. And uh, sometimes it's a feeling of hostility there. How And obviously you work, you've work you worked on both sides of that, right? You've been on, on the private side and you've been in the government side. Uh, can, can government, can the government, federal, state, can they truly be partners in this process? And, and how do they best navigate these well, relationships? Absolutely, they absolutely can be. I mean, that's what I do now. I, I work for the state and, and we're partners with people on habitat restoration, on conservation easements, on, on all of those things. Um, and the, the, the role of government, you have to decide what your role is. is. Is your role a facilitator to allow good things to happen because people want to do them? Or is your role a dictatorship to say thou shalt and never accomplish it because people don't like to be told that? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that the way we approach it here at the Wildlife Trust and, and large uh, through Governor Gordon and the state of Wyoming is our role is to facilitate the right solutions. It's not to decide ahead of time, this is the right solution, and then leap to the answer. Uh, the journey is is as much is, is as important as the end result many times, and so that that's hard. I think it, it's difficult, uh, in particular, uh, if you put it compare it for with the longevity of a ranch, which in many of these now, I mean, my kids are the sixth generation in Wyoming. Um, they're the seventh generation is on the ground and they're they're active, you know, in 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 Wyoming. Uh, and we're a young state. We're not like you know, other places where they're in 12 or 13 generations. That's kind of the, the general context of the ranching and the sportsman part of this. And then you've got a kind of a mid-level that would be uh, energy companies, construction companies, some of those that maybe aren't that multiple generation, but have been here a long time. And then you throw in uh, a government employee that hasn't been here at all. And one of the things we always try to tell people is before you sit down at the table, understand the history, understand where from whence we came, understand how we got <laughs> to where we are, and you'll be far better equipped to go forward to where you want to be if you'll do that. But to, to jump in and suddenly say, well, everything, that you, everything that's gone on for 50 years was wrong, well, you've just maligned everybody at the table. It, that isn't going to work. Do you feel hopeful for land management and wildlife management in the future? I do. Um, God, if you didn't, I wouldn't be doing this. But yes, I, I'm very hopeful. I think that uh, as I look at the at younger people now, that, that'd be you, Kateri. Um, <laughs> I, I think that- Thanks, I, Bob. I see the wonder coming back. I see people willing to sit down and, and listen. Um, but it's a new skill. I think that the new these younger generations have to learn that skill. They didn't have it, nor did some of when I started out, we didn't have it either. You know, I've told the story about we all went and had our fight for the day and we fought like tigers. And then we went to the one bar in town 
and on my side sat in one corner and the other side sat in the other corner. And we all talked about how we kicked each other's butts. Well, nobody kicked anybody's butt. Nobody won. Nothing happened. We just fought. And, and I think that I see that I'm, I'm much more of a, a willingness to, to look at multiple solutions and be inclusive. Um, and we have so much better science and so much better uh, applications. When you look at what we can do with uh, GIS, if you look at what we can do with remote sensing you, and those things, we didn't have that. I mean, remote sensing when I was a kid meant you rode a horse and you looked at the ground from up that high. Um, now they're doing it with drones and you know LIDAR and, and those kind of things. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal that can help us do things um, and, and just had a presentation Monday on that relative to restoration of degraded habitats that we just set up a call, a, a subgroup of us are going to move forward with that. And it's things like applying coal dust to soils that have been uh, degraded because it actually has carbon in it and you can bring the soils back to where they have life in them. You know, soil is a living thing. It's like the skin on us. We don't, nobody ever says the largest organ in your body is their skin. Well, largest organ on the planet is the, is the soil and we forget those things. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic. Absolutely. Well, Bob, that is that is all wonderful. And, uh, you know, I think that vision of hope is is so important. I love how you highlight embracing the young people and their ideas and, and getting them involved to, to start finding some of these solutions. So here, here's to that. Well, now uh, we come to my favorite part of every podcast where we talk about books. Uh, not that we haven't been talking about books because we've been mentioning your book, Otter's Dance, a few times. But our category for this uh, episode is books of the American West that provide a sense of place. Uh, the American West, obviously, it's open landscapes, it's mountains, it's rugged frontier, have long inspired people to write and give a sense of place. So we're going to start with you. And I understand you have quite a few. Well, I've got I've got a whole room full of these. If you really want to know the truth, we call it, it's a guest bedroom in our house. We call it the book room because it's all bookcases and they're mostly full of books about the West and, and, and sense of place and those things and going back to, you know, the 1800s and, and before, but um, yeah, there, there were a handful when I, that's a quite a challenge to throw at me and say, pick some. And so I just kind of went through and picked a few that, that I thought were instructive. Um, the first one that I would mention is uh, the annals of the former world. Uh, that's by John McPhee. And I mean, let's just put it this way. Anything John McPhee writes is excellent. There, there's never been a better writer. I'm absolutely amazed at the guys, whatever he picks, it's, it, you're just absorbed, but it is the compendium of all the different books that he did on geology. And the one in there about Wyoming is called rising from the plains. And it's a, it is a must read if you live in Wyoming. It's the book that I give people who move here and say, well, read this first. But if you read that book, it also includes the basin and range. It includes coming into the country, which is about Alaska. Um, it, it, it's the underpinning for everything, understanding the geology, the soil uh, generation, what, how these areas were, were formed and built is critical. It, it's back to that if we learn together and we all have a common view. So that's one that, that I think is, uh, is a phenomenal book and, and, it, and it's everything, it, it's all of it. It isn't just the, uh, the portion that um, is, uh, is just on Wyoming. So that's one. Um, Riding the White Horse Home by Teresa Jordan. And Teresa is a, a dear friend. We've known each other since we were young. She's a fabulous writer and author. And it's a, a family. It's a accounting of a family and and how that went together over generations. And and it's it's poetry. It's beautifully done. Uh, it's a classic book. And very similar to that is My Ranch Two by Mary Bud Flitner, which Mary is my second cousin, third cousin, something like that. Um, it, it, we get we confuse this. I grew up working for her father. My son is named after her father uh, because we were that close, but by blood, it, it's different branches of the family. But Mary talks about a woman's position and women 
in the West and their role. And that has been understated, uh, to, tragically understated. There are women, every, behind every successful ranch is a strong woman. They, there is no, there is no other way that it happens. And I look at my wife that way. I look at all of the mentors I had, half of them are men and half of them are women. And Mary is one of them, but she writes about the decision-making and, and the role that women play uh, in, in the West and in, in a ranch or in community. And, and a lot of times they're holding the community together while guys like me are out there wandering around in a big hat and, and chasing cows and probably not finding them. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a fabulous book as well. Uh, so the, the fourth book is something, and it, it probably, I bookended this a little bit, you know, Annals of the Former World is somewhat academic. It's the geology. Then you've got the two that I think are very evocative and, and two fantastic writers, uh, Teresa and Mary. And then the fourth one is called Locust by Lockwood. And, and it is absolutely fascinating. And there are a number of books like that, but it's the one I picked out because he was one of my professors when I got my master's in Laramie, but he wrote the, the history and the natural biology of the locust. And it's fascinating because they basically shaped the West and then they disappeared. And so Jeff goes through and, and lays all this out. And that, that book is an absolute must read. Um, he's got several others as well. One is called Six-Legged Soldiers that uh, talks about insects in warfare. And, uh, but he's an entomologist, uh, philosopher at heart. And that book is, that one is one of those books that when you read it, you just set it down and went, wow, I, that really, really struck me. And hmm. so those are uh, three Wyoming authors and one who wrote about Wyoming. And, and, but they're all applicable to the, to the West as a whole. Outstanding choices. I'm going to have to check out that Teresa Jordan book. That just sounds lovely. Terry, how about you? Um, so I did three. Um, the first one um, is a book I just finished. Um, we, my book club just finished uh, Lonesome Dove, which I had never read before. And uh, oh my God, I loved it so much. It was amazing. And I just... I really can't get over the storytelling. And since this was about a sense of place in the American West, uh, I thought that that would be a really good pick. And I think a lot of young people aren't picking up books that are older, especially like older Westerns. And I think we need to be because they're just, there's like this idea that they're not literary enough or they're not cool enough or whatever. And I don't know, this just really changed my mind about it. Um, so Lonesome Dove was pick number one. Number two, I went from kind of like more mountainous region to the desert, read by Terry Tempest Williams. Um, I am pretty obsessed with Terry Tempest Williams. If uh, we've ever talked about books, you probably know this, but um, Red is one of my favorites because I adore the Red Rock Desert in uh, the Utah area. And I think it's a super special place. And that book is all about that and all about the ways that erosion has shaped the landscape and in her very uh, lyrical and beautiful writing and brings in personal stories. And it's, um, yeah, it's just a really, really good one. Um, my third is not a book. It's a person. Um, I had to throw Barry Lopez in there because although he doesn't write exclusively about the American West, I think that his writing about the American West has a very special sense of place. Um, and I think that he's, uh, he's just so ex important to conservation writing and his writing is so expansive. Uh, I had to throw him in there, even though he's not a book you know. So what about you, Sam? Well, this, this was a real tough one for me because first of all, you know, we publish a lot of Western books about, about place. And so I, I, I you know, I don't want to 
promote just fulcrum titles, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of my favorites, like Land Circle by Linda Hazelstrom, which is just a beautiful, beautiful collection. And talk about women writing uh, about the West and living in the West uh, is just a wonderful, wonderful book. I, I think about the first uh, piece of fiction that we published, Broken Trail by Alan Jeffran, which became the basis for the Robert Duvall uh, old cowboy movie. You know, it take place in the, the late uh, 1800s. But talk about just a wonderful sense of place, the West as it was then. Uh, I think about uh, Joseph Marshall's novel, The Long Knives Are Crying, which was a story told from the Sioux perspective about the battle at Little Bighorn. So, you know, got a, some favorites among Fulcrum books. But Kateri, you challenged me to think outside of, of Fulcrum as well. And so I also have three. Um, first one is a book by Dan O'Brien called Buffalo for the Broken Heart. Uh, which I just absolutely love. Dan was a cattle rancher and uh, he was having a hard time making ends meet as a cattle rancher and a friend introduced him to bison and uh, he just decided to take up buffalo ranching and uh, just walk through the whole romance and the highs and the lows of this, but it's just such a wonderful story and he's such a great voice uh, in telling this story. Um, then I had to get uh, one of my favorite novelists like you. You get these writers that you just absolutely love. Uh, and I and this was actually one that the three of us talked about when we were at the Mountains and Plains Booksellers show, Cormac McCarthy, uh, who has just written so beautifully about Texas and the border uh, country. Uh, everything from All the Pretty Horses and, and that whole trilogy to Scarily Blood Meridian. Uh, but I picked No Country for Old Men just because uh, it just... It maybe it's about me getting a little older, but it was such a ruminative book and still captured the the border as it is in more contemporary times. Uh, and then finally, I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't uh, pick one of my old favorites at Abbey, uh, Desert Solitaire, which he wrote uh, while being a park ranger in one of my favorite parts of the country in that southeastern part of Utah. Uh, you know, Ed Abbey was cranky, irascible. Uh, but just loved the land. And, and uh, you know, Bob, uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, John McPhee, because I was also thinking of Annals of the Former World. Uh, and then it, as I was thinking about Ad Abbey, it reminded me, I'm just going to have to read this, but uh, about a year ago, McPhee wrote this collection in the New Yorker of just short pieces. And he had this wonderful mm -hmm. piece of about Ed Abbey and bringing Ed Abbey out to Princeton. I'm just going to read part of this here. So uh, he they they kind of walked around and they ended up back in uh, for a for a lecture talking about desert solitaire says loose lanky in his Western hat and boots emitting that quiet humor he was one likable guy, but that memorable walk is not the most memorable item that has lingered from Abby's visit. Most of the questions asked by the crowd that night had to do with desert solitaire, including one from a woman who appeared to be at least Abby's age, which was 45. She brought up an experiment, quote, an experiment that Abby describes in the book, famous, uh, his famous experiment, conducted outside his house trailer in Utah when he volunteered a passing rabbit as experimentee. He picked up a rock, fired at the rabbit, and brained it on the spot. The woman in Princeton said to him, how could you do that? How could you be so cruel? How could you? And so forth. She really lit into him, sitting back in the armchair with his legs at full stretch, one boot across the other, he seemed to be aiming through a kind of gun sight formed by his toes. There was a long silence, Abby silent, everyone in the room silent, and more silence. Finally, Abby said, I won't do it again. Muted laughter rippled here and there. And then again, Abby fell silent for an even longer time. And then he said, not to that rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I just absolutely... I read that and I just, I, I still read that and it just makes me laugh so much. Well, Bob, thank you so much for, for caring so much about the land, about all the, the creatures that live on the land, about how we have to coexist with both the land and those creatures. And for all your work that you've done, where you've actually rolled up your sleeves and gotten out there in so many different ways and for being a, a wonderful steward in the tradition of people like Aldo Leopold. We really do appreciate all your work and, and all your writing and all your humor along the way. Thank you, Sam. It's been great to work with you guys, and I hope that, uh, I hope that we're right and our optimism is not misplaced, but I, I have great confidence in where we're headed. I would agree. Well, thank you.